Film Modi by Christopher Slatsky. The art of film can only really exist through a highly organized betrayal of reality. Francois Truffaut. Leslie had memorized the entirety of human wreckage's stock, from the piles of dusty bootlegs and stacks of Eurosleaze exploitation to the cinema verite haphazardly shelved. The store's walls were papered with posters of rare or lost films. He was particularly fond of a ghastly yellow print depicting a smiling young woman holding a trefine drill poised just above her shaved scalp. You're a horror guy, right? Paula looked up from counting her till. She only engaged in conversation with Leslie due to their mutual interest in film his incessant loitering around her business and refusal to purchase anything made her reluctant to open the store every morning. Leslie nodded, continued reading the description on a Japanese VHS import of An Orgy of Entrails. Someone dropped these off this morning. Paula held up a handful of black and white photocopies. They depicted a movie screen, a jumble of women's heads and naked torsos stacked on the stage below. The film titles were printed in tiny cramped letters, difficult to read on the cheap reproduction. Leslie was only able to make out Lust of the Vampirous, Slit Slut, and something that may have been dull humiliation. The date and showtimes were listed just above the event's name, Abattoir Fest. Film festival? Looks like it. Mostly your schlock, giallo shit, bunch of horror directors I haven't even heard of. You know, Aquino, McBride. Paula snorted in amusement. Van Riesen? Leslie had to reluctantly admit he didn't. His gaze moved down the page, snagged on one title. Film Modi. He knew as much as there was to be known about Film Modi. Its writer, director, and producer were anonymous. Rumor was it may have been a collective of filmmakers. Shot in Germany, or at least the unidentified actors spoke oddly accent to German, and released in the summer of 74 for one weekend in just a handful of showings where it was swiftly condemned for its disturbing violence and sexual content. All known prints had long been misplaced or destroyed. Little else was known about the film's production, the holy grail of lost films. The mysterious producers had even gone so far as to hire extras to protest outside of showings, waving signs and chanting slogans condemning the film's alleged use of actual snuff footage. This attempt to manipulate the viewing public had the desired effect. An obscure foreign horror flick became a newsworthy sensation for several days until Nixon's resignation pushed the story aside. Look it, Paula tapped the page in Leslie's hand. They even dug up one of those Tingler machines. Leslie looked at the ad again. An asterisk hovered next to film Modi like a tiny puckered black star. His gaze lowered to the other dim star fallen to the bottom of the page. The precise calligraphic print read, Featuring a Restored Oscillator. It's not a Tingler. His heart raced. Really? Swore I read Tingler. Human wreckage was muggy inside. Sweat dotted Leslie's face. He ran a slick palm across his dreads. Kinda like the Tingler. Oscillator was more like, uh, like sense around. Sound system used for the disaster flick earthquake. So loud it rattled the whole place. Paula raised a pierced eyebrow. Films were something else back then. Who needs character development, mise-en-scene, narrative, camera placement? She held her forefingers together, thumbs straight out to form a square, framing Leslie's head in a shot. He didn't acknowledge Paula's sarcasm. Gimmicks ended around the time of Waters' polyester, with those scratch-and-sniff cards. Actually, now that I think about it, Gaspar Noe used something like the oscillator, in Irreversible, played a really low 28 hertz frequency background sound that was supposed to disorient the audience. You know, make them sick to the stomach, dizzy and shit.
Oscillator did something like that, too, but more psychedelic, like those CIA programs blasting the public with high-frequency sound waves. Incapacitate the central nervous system. Make the enemy hallucinate. Wig out. Leslie wiggled his fingers in the air to emphasize his point. Paula folded her arms across her chest. Not my idea of a good movie night. Film Modi wasn't supposed to be entertainment. It was supposed to be an ordeal. Oscillator was going to change the way people watched film, like actually physically fuck them up. Everyone was going to be altered, not just because of the sound, but the environment, the experience itself. Paula leaned back against the counter. You ever see through a glass darkly? Great use of sound. The scene with the roar of the helicopter's engine triggering Harriet Anderson's breakdown. Damn, what a performance. Film has its own language. Like we know what it sounds like when someone gets punched in the face, but it's a completely different sound when it happens in a movie. Its own way of communicating the five senses, different than real life. What's the gore like? What? It's Bergman. You do know there's more to films than tits and blood, right? Leslie stroked his chin in faux contemplation. Maybe. Anyway, so few people saw film Modi, there's not much to go on. The handful of critics that went to a screening refused to describe the plot, just wrote shit about it, tore it to shreds, even accused the theater employees of slipping acid into their RCs. Paula laughed. LSD. Now that's a gimmick Castle never tried. She gestured toward the sheet. Festival is at the old Klein Theater on Burrow Street. No idea that place was still around. Leslie was just ten years old when he'd seen his first film unattended at the Klein. Sorority bloodbath. The gruesome makeup effects, gratuitous nudity and vestigial plot led to his love of underground films. The filthier the better. Last he'd heard, the theater had closed down and become a refuge for the city's booming junkie population. He hadn't heard they'd renovated and reopened. Supposed to spend time with my daughter that weekend, but I think I can talk her mom into watching her. I deserve some me time, right? Asking the wrong person. You going? No can do. Berman is coming to the store that night with a lead to do a signing for craniofacial holocaust. Don't expect a big turnout, but there are some hardcore gorehounds that'll waste some time talking to the director. Who knows, one of the little leeches might actually buy something. Leslie should have been excited he was on the way to Abattoir Fest, but he was still fuming over his daughter's inability to do even the most basic chores around the apartment. He was tempted to just stay on the bus until it took him away from this ugly city, away from Samantha and a girlfriend who constantly made excuses for their kids' problems, away from an existence that drained him that much more each day and replaced the void with the realization that the best life had to offer had long passed. Sure, he'd overreacted, but it wasn't his fault. For Christ's sake, Samantha was fourteen now. He didn't care if her delayed development was a challenge. She'd enough brains to know not to piss herself again. The bus passed through dilapidated neighborhoods. He hated to waste a fare on a ride to the Klein, but he couldn't afford another DUI. The graffiti-streaked windows presented a haggard man. Gray dreadlocks, red furrows of razor irritation, four-day-old stubble on his cheeks like smears of ash. His reflection looked like a battered thaumatrope, face intermittently broken by the dim street lights. The driver pulled into a part of town where starlight slid off pale concrete and bounced from cracked glass at just the right angle to paint the buildings a tarnished lead you. What little color remained oozed from malfunctioning traffic lights throbbing red. The bus groaned to a stop. Leslie walked a block until he saw the Klein Theater sign. Pieces had fallen away, the paint had long faded. It now spelled Line Eater, but still mimicked an old-fashioned clapboard. He was giddy with anticipation. All the stress over his disabled daughter was pushed aside even if only briefly.
Some of Leslie's fondest childhood memories had been spent at the Klein. His father's drinking problem had been a mixed blessing as it initiated the weekend ritual of getting dropped off at the old movie theater, but also meant a ride home would only return after running tabs at every bar in town. But it was all worth it. The physical abuse and any lingering emotional misery had long been dulled by the wide array of weird films he'd been lucky enough to experience. The Klein used to be a place where he could dream, a refuge from the reality of a shattered home. He wondered why there were so few cars in the parking lot. The handwritten message in the box office window read Abattoir Fest, Friday, November 13th. The ticket booth was vacant. He cupped his hands over the glass. What little could be seen inside was due to the wan glow of the heat bulb in a vacant popcorn machine. Three of the four theaters had film titles posted, but Leslie couldn't make them out. The theater door with no title above was larger than the others. An employee must be sweeping in the lobby. Why else would anything be shuffling around in the darkened interior? He was startled to see an arm splayed on the floor palm up, the rest of the puffy limb obscured by shadow. He pressed his face against the window. It was just a crimson velvet rope strung to a floor stanchion that had toppled over. He wiped his sour breath from the glass and hit his knuckles gently against the window. Anybody home? A greasy palm print and the glass quivering from his tapping created the illusion of something thin falling to the floor. It crawled behind the concessions. But there was nothing alive in there. Only shadows moving about like wisps of water-thinned blood swirling into drains. The place was empty. Maybe there was another entrance or an employee outside. He walked around the corner of the building into the long alley that ran between the theater and a boarded-up warehouse. The flickering exit sign lit up the grimy brick walls of the dead end. Something was piled several feet high just outside the door. It looked like a stack of discarded mannequin parts. Leslie thought it was probably a promotional display staff had dumped out back for the trash truck. Several pieces were battered and missing bits. It was only the stuttering light that made it seem as if one of the hands was swaying back and forth in greeting. He walked out of the alley as fast as he could anyway. He was about to return to the bus stop when a dim light turned on inside the theater lobby. An old woman was standing at attention in the ticket booth. The illumination stained her skin the color of pewter. I was worried the festival had been canceled, Leslie said good-naturedly. The old woman didn't respond. One for abattoir fest. Binge drinking over the last few hours made Leslie's inflection come across as more demanding than intended. The woman didn't acknowledge his presence. So they actually got an oscillator up and running? The geriatric's hands shot through the gap, closed on Leslie's wrist with a jaw-trap grip, pulled his hand through the partition's small opening, fingers scraped against glass. She stamped the back of his hand with an image of the theater's clapboard logo. <laughs> Shit, thanks a lot. The money sat untouched. As Leslie walked into the lobby, he glanced back at the booth but quickly looked away. The ticket seller's posture suggested something lumpy and dusty had occupied her theater uniform. He sucked at his bloodied knuckle. The concession stand was closed. Judging by the black grease stains on the counters and rotting patches of carpeted floor, it didn't look like food or beverages had been sold here in quite some time. He was okay with that, though. His stomach roiled from the nauseous combination of blood and alcohol. Movie posters curled from the walls, stiff like dried skin. He wondered how bad this place must have looked before the renovation. Theater number one was showing The Raped Void, number two, Screaming Throat. Leslie wasn't familiar with either film. The third displayed Lust of the Vampiress. He recognized this one from the flyer. He was curious about the larger unmarked theater, probably a storage warehouse. He heard activity within, the clank of machinery, 
Maybe they were setting up the oscillator. He walked into the lust of the vampirous theater. The seats were a plush burgundy and surprisingly elegant. Dust wafted from the fabric. He stifled a sneeze so as not to annoy the handful of patrons, though they seemed captivated by the blank screen and made no move to acknowledge his presence. He wasn't too surprised at the small audience, as even he was unfamiliar with many of the movies advertised tonight. But he was here for film Modi. Everything else was filler. Movement caught his eye. He glanced up at the ceiling. Several panels were missing, their vacant squares dark and ominous as the entrance to an abandoned house's attic. He turned his whole body around to look at the projection room, hoping to catch a glimpse of the oscillator being prepared, or even any evidence such a device existed and wasn't simply an invention to draw ticket sales. There was nothing but the dark window. He realized he didn't have any idea what an oscillator even looked like. He had an image of something robotic and menacing squatting next to the projector, or maybe several small units placed in each dark corner of the theater. The lights lowered, the projector's beam shot across the room like a lighthouse beacon. Lust of the Vampirus started. Thirty minutes in, Leslie chalked it up as yet another softcore Euro thriller full of buxom undead girls and diaphanous nightgowns. The superior cinematography would appeal to the art film crowd, but he saw little else of worth. He'd seen it all before and done much better by the likes of Jean Roulin. Then the lesbian vampires started doing something to each other he didn't find particularly erotic. Their gestures were overwrought. There was far too much chocolate sauce-colored blood on the voluptuous actress's thighs. Something lying just beneath the soundtrack surface suggested breaking glass or rust forming. Leslie found himself looking away twice. On the third occasion he confronted the screen with his gaze but something in his peripheral vision needled him for attention. He was frustrated with his childishness. He wasn't some kid peeking between his fingers at an actor in a rubber suit stalking some damsel in distress. He'd managed to sit through crush films and even a snuff flick he thought might be legitimately illegal. This was nothing. One of the viewers in the front row began wriggling in their seat, tilted his head back and moaned loudly. Leslie tried to ignore the pervert and concentrate on the rest of the movie. Had the staff activated the oscillator? He hadn't seen anyone working here other than the old woman in the ticket booth. But he was sweating profusely, a nervous knot clenched in his gut. He had no idea why anyone would have started the device during this film, though. He'd assumed it was for film Modi only. Maybe somebody had accidentally thrown the switch. Something slithered low near the bottom row. It moved with a muscular grace, like a python wrapping itself around a branch, reflecting a gray, moist hide. Leslie pushed himself up in his chair, peered into the gloom. Just a glistening stain and erratic light worming across the floor. The next feature started immediately. Filmed in phantoscope flashed on the screen. Music swelled as M D C C C C L X X X V I I was followed by a crude hand drawn intertitle. The latest in blood and guts. The soundtrack erupted with a chorus of unfamiliar animal cries spiraling into screams. A menagerie of species Leslie didn't recognize paraded across the screen. He'd once read an essay on Edison's electrocuting an elephant but this was far more horrific. How the filmmakers managed to incite the creatures to do such things to each other was baffling. Even a starved beast wouldn't inflict such hideous acts in such an imaginative manner. He couldn't believe that what he was watching wasn't some elaborate visual effect, but the film was far too old to deceive with sophisticated digital tricks. The latest in blood and guts ended with no credits. Leslie assumed there'd be a break now, so he stood up with the intention of using the bathroom. If it wasn't the oscillator churning his guts, it must have been the alcohol. But the next film began right away, 
He sat back down, crossed his legs to alleviate the pressure on his bladder and bowels. Several more films were screened. Alcohol must have dulled his memory. He was hard-pressed to remember the names of any he'd just seen, much less plot details. He wasn't sure how much longer he could remain seated. Finally, film Modi began. Leslie clapped but stopped when someone a few seats down turned to glare at him. He thought it was cool that some horror fans were so devoted they dressed up in grotesque masks even for a small festival like this. He tensed, listened for any auditory cues, a blinking light in the dark, a change in the air. Nothing. But they must have activated the oscillator. Why else would the aisle seats seem to be undulating like waves? Film Modi opened with a medium shot of a dirt floor surrounded by three concrete walls, the fourth removed for the camera crew. An uncomfortably young-looking girl sat in the center of the room. She was naked and kneeling, face covered by a mauve paper butterfly mask. Her arms and stomach were wet with fake blood that looked like the melted crayon waxy gore in Profondo Rosso. The girl's skin, her mouth, the way she moved, all seemed hauntingly familiar. She slowly stood. Her waist was impossibly narrow, tapered to a wasp-thin shape. The soundtrack was just the swish of limbs against wet skin. Cries spilled from the speakers. The tension was nearly unbearable. She walked towards the camera. The girl's breathing didn't match her sobs. The screen filled with her face and plump crayon red lips. She broke into a smile that threatened to become beatific. Her lush mouth dominated the theater. The soundtrack's crumbling stone sound vibrated the room. Her knees were bent the wrong way. The film must have been missing a reel. She suddenly appeared in another room with several other actors, all sitting cross-legged on a dirt floor. Everyone wore butterfly masks, but nothing else. An intertitle read, Sex Vela, Sex Vela, Sex Vela. Leslie found the makeup effects disturbing, but not particularly convincing, especially that hypersaturated blood. He thought the mutilation of the actor's genitalia was amateurish prosthetic work, but their horrified reactions made him queasy. Not bad for such a low budget sleaze fest. The audience sat completely motionless, slumped at awkward angles in their plush seats. The masturbator was mewling in what Leslie thought was prelude to orgasm. On listening further, it sounded more like the panicked cry of someone too deeply submerged in nightmare to wake up. If the oscillator hadn't been on before, it must be operational now. A growl reverberated, rattled Leslie's chest, spread through his muscles. The theater walls felt as if they were closing in. Phil Modi was off somehow, the frame rate wrong. Leslie still had to use the bathroom. He needed to talk to management, request they turn off the oscillator. That should clear things up. He stumbled up the aisle, couldn't believe he was taking a break from a film he'd always dreamt of seeing, but his head was filled with a strange soundtrack, the chattering susurrus of an unseen ensemble. It felt as if his brain was pulsing against his skull. He had to get some fresh air, had to get away from the radius of that oscillator fucking with his head. He couldn't have been the only one to complain about the machine. The lobby was empty. The old woman in the ticket booth was gone. A loud knocking emanated from inside the unmarked theater. The gibbering music in Leslie's head made him wretch. The theater door shook. Something within made the sound of oily plastic sliding against rusty metal, the clank of gears and a moaning like blowing into a bottle. Someone frantically pummeled against the other side of the door. Leslie took a step away, but not quick enough to avoid the door striking him in the face. Metal hinges tore, a stray screw sailed across the room, pinged off the ticket booth's glass. He collapsed, cheek and chin pressed so forcefully against the filthy carpet he no longer looked like himself. An impossibly thin figure stood just inside the theater, its form subtly distorted 
not bilaterally symmetrical, like a poorly constructed clay model, one side drooping lower than the other. The screen behind it glowed with an otherworldly haze. Atavistic images caroused up there. Odd animals frolicked, clucked and chittered and brachiated and crawled in a sinuous manner with difficult-to-define limbs. A little girl stepped into frame from the right. Her face was shiny. Leslie couldn't explain why he knew she was slathered in lard, much less why he was certain he'd seen those cheekbones and eyes before. Something released itself from a phlegm-colored edge fog at frame left. It lovingly coiled itself onto the girl's face in a precise shape like a carefully applied swirl of feces. She was silent as several other weird predators joined in to render features anonymous. Leslie was screaming so loudly he tasted blood from his raw throat. The person towering over him was far too tall to be anything but a distorted shadow. He'd suffered a concussion. The contours of the man's face were wrong. Leslie couldn't fully comprehend what he was looking at. A concussion. It hunched to pass through the doorway. Head of Amber a gelatinous sculpture, special effects prop used for exploding headshots and gory film scenes. Far too many narrow limbs propelled it in one long stride until its makeup effect face was touching Leslie's face. Invisible bodies press against him, slide over his skin with the texture of tangled kelp bulbs washing over a drowning victim as he sinks into unconsciousness. Leslie woke up back in his theater chair. The oscillator's music roared. The seats were now all occupied, the audience clapping and whistling enthusiastically. A remarkably skinny form sat next to him, but he couldn't turn his head to see who it was. It didn't matter much. His attention was fixed on the bizarre antics projected on screen, and he couldn't imagine why he'd want to look at anything else. The thin companion touched Leslie's forehead with a long finger, carved out a perfectly smooth circle, plucked the bone coin away, poked its finger through the skull into the hole. Exposed to the air, the film's colors bled into Leslie's fevered brain, the hue of deformed peacocks, glass-tailed and shimmering. The projector's light revealed crevices in the screen. Leslie remembered a book on caves he'd treasured as a child. It had the most beautiful full-page pictures of speleothem in ancient caverns. Phil Modi's third act. Something with far too many tongues smeared its saliva across an expanse of hairless flesh stretched taut across a room. The camera panned up its length to a pair of swollen eyes framed by a mauve butterfly mask. The audience hooted and screeched, wriggled in their seats with excitement. Upright ticks, starved bags of viscera adorned with hair and teeth clamoring at the screen for nourishment. They turned their far too large heads toward the rear of the theater and siphoned the projector's light into mouths as dark as a changeover cue. The oscillator's drone masked all other sounds, the dark filled with colors both wonderful and impossible. The wound in Leslie's head slurped more light into its depths. He could truly see now, true sight finally recognizing those eyes on the screen. An intertitle appeared. The streets grow active with feral hunger. Stop the film, please, Leslie whimpered. After Samantha had failed to develop normally, Leslie quickly realized that watching a loved one suffer the pangs of existence would slowly destroy him as well. It wasn't his fault she'd never have a normal life. It wasn't his choice to be saddled with a responsibility for a girl that would never read a book without assistance, drive a car, or graduate from college. He knew he was selfish and petty and abusive, but existence was all that and more. The universe wasn't apathetic, it simply had an obscene sense of humor, and Leslie was a victim of a genetic pratfall he'd named Samantha. You can turn the oscillator off now. I don't want to see everything anymore. The final intertitle flashed on the screen.
scavengers scurry from the sewers to lap at the wet afterbirth of night. I don't want to dream any more, please. He prayed the reel would change, but he knew it never would. As Samantha's eyes filled the screen, the camera pressed in with a zolly shot. A phosphorus white light filled Leslie's vision. A light as harsh and raw as peeled stars flooded the theater.